So let's talk about what a peptide is. Sure. So peptide is really by definition, it's a small protein. So it's a protein. Proteins are made up of amino acids, which are, we call them the building blocks of protein. And a peptide is made up of 50 or fewer amino acids. Proteins can be hundreds, if not thousands of amino acids long, and then you know, fold it into these intricate little origami shapes. And peptides aren't that different, except they're just smaller. Your listeners have heard of peptides before, even if they sit and don't think they have. The most popular, well-known peptide anybody's heard of is insulin. Insulin is right. a peptide, mm-hmm. right? Peptide. Yeah. Now, the peptides that we're going to talk about today, for the most part, and it, and it depends if we're, we're talking about the longer chain peptides or if we're talking about the bioregulator peptides. So I'll just jump right in and define, distinguish those for the audience please. now. Please, yes, please. And then we'll get into the theory of aging. So the longer chain peptides, which people may have heard of, are things like BPC-157, which is body, BPC stands for body protective compound. So BPC-157, things like CJC-1295, ipamorelin, GHKCU, which is known as the copper peptide. And I know you maybe wanted to touch on that. There's others like thymosin alpha-1, thymosin beta-4. These are thymus peptides. So these are all fragments of naturally occurring peptides in the human body. So they're not the full peptide that occurs in the human body, but they're they're fragments that scientists have assessed and identified as binding to specific receptors on the surface of cells and through messaging through the cell are then able to either initiate cellular cascades or they're able to influence the expression of your genes, but that's through chemical messengers. Bioregulator peptides are almost a subset of those peptides, and they are only two to four amino acids long. So they are tiny. They are the tiniest of the tiniest proteins. And that gives them the ability to actually travel into the cell. So the bioregulator peptide doesn't, it it does interact with messengers on the cell, but they're specific messengers that then allow them to pass through the cell membrane into the nucleus of the cell where they are able to bind to DNA. And when they bind to that DNA, they then upregulate the production of very specific proteins. Imagine the DNA helix and imagine it just unwinding just so to expose a binding site for this very specific amino acid sequence. And what we do, what happens when something binds to your DNA, it, is, it elicits a response that, that causes the production of very specific proteins. And in the case of bioregulator peptides, what's really happening is this kind of like this rejuvenation at a cellular level of whatever tissue, gland, or organ is being targeted. So the bioregulators, if you will, target organ systems, organs, very specific tissues or glands, whereas those other longer chain uh, peptides that we talked about earlier, it's more about it's, I mean, sometimes it's targeting tissues and glands. But also, like, for example, like a BPC-157 is going to have receptors virtually all over the body in different places. And so in different tissues. So, for example, in skeletal muscle, it's going to upregulate the the expression of your growth hormone receptors so that when you're when you're releasing growth hormone, it's going to be received and it's going to have more of an impact at that space. And what BPC-157 is noted I mean, it's noted for doing a lot of things, but one of the things it's really good for is promoting the healing of tissues like muscles, tendons, ligaments, that kind of stuff. Which we know decreases as we age, right? So like tendons, right? even if we talk about in the extreme with an injury, a strain or a sprain, it takes orders of magnitude, it's much longer to heal a tendinous or ligamentous injury in your 40s, 50s and 60s compared to your 20s or 30s. Maybe in part because we have less, co- because this is a naturally occurring compound, peptide. is it not? Yeah. Or pe- it's yeah. a peptide. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go yeah. on. Yeah. But I mean, so BPC-157 originates in the gut. It's part of a much greater complex. And it's, it's like its main claim to fame is that it is incredible at healing any part of the GI tract from your mouth to the, to your anus all the way right? So it can be a very powerful compound. It has been shown to be a very powerful compound, particularly in animal studies, but there's growing numbers of human studies showing 
that it is really powerful at stimulating the healing of that whole endothelium, that whole, if you know, for, et, for ulcers, for leaky gut, for even there's been studies on colitis and those types of conditions. Now, just to be clear, people, you know, when I first heard about peptides, I was like, oh my God, this is it. The Holy Grail. We found the solution. Everybody stop. We're good. <laughs> and yes, they're incredibly powerful and you still need all the other things in place for that healing to, to really take place. So, yeah, so if you have a terrible diet and you're not moving and you're not managing your stress and you're sleeping like garbage and you have pollution and environmental toxicants and, you know, endocrine disrupting, you know, mm -hmm. chemicals in like the peptides are going to help, but they are, you know, we're, we want to major in the majors, right? So we want to make sure yeah. that those are, those foundational basics are in place first. And then this is, if I'm understanding you correctly, Nat, this is how we, we layer this, we layer this peptide and, or these bioregulator therapies on top of a lifestyle that has already been, I don't want to use the word optimized, but yeah. maybe maximized, maybe maximized. Yeah. Is, and, yeah. and sometimes even, the, and particularly the bioregulators in a lot of the studies that they've, they've published, often the bioregulators is used as an adjunct to conventional therapy and they just make okay. it better. So in the case of a BPC-157, when, especially when you were talking about musculoskeletal issues, it really, it can accelerate healing. In, a, in an incredible way. But as I will say to people, you know, in addition to the foundations of lifestyle and diet and sleep and all the things, particularly when it comes to musculoskeletal, and you will, you will get this in spades, is have you addressed the biomechanics of the issue? Because, right? Because if you have a misalignment of some kind that's driving an imbalance in a muscle, causing a muscle to be strained, sprained, or whatever, and you haven't addressed the, the bio, the, like the, chem, the mechanical imbalance, Right. You might help the healing a little bit, but it's just going to like you're kind of bailing out a leaky boat. Right. So but having said that, it's like these are really powerful tools in in a toolkit. I want to talk about BPC-157 because that to me seems like a bioregulator because it, it influences the muscles, influences the tendons, the ligaments, but it's really maybe the most famous, at least, you know, mm -hmm. for, for a layman such as myself, that's in the one that's most well known. Why is that not considered a bioregulator? Is this just the history? Is it like the nomenclature? Is it who discovered it? I know that there is... Mm. I don't know if it's there's always there's always drama between scientists. Is it be, is it because like it wasn't I don't I forget the Russian scientist. I forget Kevin's his name. Doctor. Yes. Is it because yeah. it wasn't his discovery and it was someone else's? But we can but we see it systemically. BPC one fifty seven has systemic like yeah. a bioregulator for me is something that is going to influence the body systemically. So if I'm mm, yes or, and no. Okay. Okay. L let me let me stop you there. The yeah. reason why and and there is however a peptide that is not a bioregulator that a lot of people think should be a bioregulator. So number 1, yes, there is an issue around you know, it's a little bit like grapes that are not grown in the champagne region can't right. be the wine that's made for them cannot be called champagne. So there is right. a piece there is a little piece of that at play. But when it comes to BPC157 Remember what we said earlier, the bioregulator, the hallmark of the bioregulator is that it can cross the cellular membrane into the nucleus of the cell and, and bind directly to the, to DNA. the DNA. So okay. it is an actual direct epigenetic switch. BPC-157 is too big. It's too many. It's like 19 amino acids or something. So it's too big to get into the cell. So what it does is it impacts the receptors on the surface of the cell and okay. it does its work from there. Okay. Now, it still will influence certain expression of certain genes sometimes, but that's not its only trick. It's a lot broader than that. And so BPC-157 is going to have impact. It can have impact on the brain. It protects the body from the... It actually is really interesting. They did some studies where it, it protected from the negative effects of steroids, like steroid injections. It also as you can imagine, because it has so many gut healing properties, it can protect from the negative impact of NSAIDs. What's real now, ideally we're not using NSAIDs, but every once in a while you come across a situation medically where maybe they're required. I don't know. I know there's people that would dispute that. I'm not a doctor, so I'm not, I'm not going to wade into that. But the cool thing is that BPC-157 can go a long way to mitigating the damage. It also has 
anti-inflammatory effect. It has analgesic effect. It does have balancing effect on the dopaminergic, serotonergic, and GABAergic se centers in the brain. It's, it's organ protective. So it's known to be protective for the heart, for the pancreas, for the liver. Like it has, it's kind of like everybody's BFF, right? It can play a role in the whole system. It's good for the kidneys. There are certain studies that have shown that it can be helpful with blood pressure regulation. Again, not on its own necessarily. And it always depends. And, you know, the first question everybody always has to ask themselves when we're talking about this stuff, and frankly, about anything, is why is this problem happening in the first place? Like people will often write or say to me, Nat, what's the peptide for X? And I, my, the, the, I mean, you know, the loathed answer is it depends. And do you have an understanding of why X is happening, right? Because if you don't know what's driving X, it's a little bit like the, the biomechanical issue a minute ago. If you don't know, like it could be that you just, I don't know, you lifted too heavy a weight, like you were doing something crazy like CrossFit and you were moving too fast at too high load and you tore something. Or it could be that you have you have an imbalance that's putting your body in a position where a, a muscle or a tendon or a ligament is more vulnerable than it should be. So you need to understand those things to understand where does the peptide fit in, what is the right peptide to fit in, and how am I going to resolve the whole issue over the long term. Okay. So the mechanism, so the distinguishing, you know, coming back to sort of the definition yeah. here, just so I can frame this up for the listener as well as for myself, sure. is that the bioregulator is going to be acting directly on the DNA because it's getting mm -hmm. into the cell nucleus. Okay. Yeah. And then the peptides will be acting as on the, let's say on the, on the surface, on the receptor, which then can activate, a, you know, a series of mechanisms within the cell, within the yeah. cytoplasm that's going to affect the, the, the result. Okay. Thumbs up. Nailed Got it. the thumbs up. All right.